Welcome to Cross Talk this week. I am Death Valley Insider's Jermaine Every. I'm an analyst here on Death Valley Insider. And this week, we're cross-talking the Auburn game with Matt Cohen of AL.com. Uh, so, Matt, just give us a little bit about yourself and tell us how you came to covering Auburn for AL.com. Sure. So, first, thanks, thanks for having me. I have been covering Auburn for the very long time of about two and a half months. <laughs> uh, so I got I got here from I so I, I finished college up in the Big Ten at Indiana in the spring in the spring of 22 and spent kind of the last year or so in Tampa at the Tampa Bay Times covering not sports like a lot of cops courts a lot of kind of a lot of a lot of blood and guts <laughs> and, then, and then ended up back in sports uh with this job when it opened up because it wasn't for me and enjoyed my time there enjoyed the people there but the job mm-hmm. wasn't, wasn't 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 for me so got back to what i know which is sports and here we are in the south um this is on where i've been i'm you know i'm from washington dc so this is this is a very it, it's been all different to me learning a whole new place a whole new conference <laughs> and everything so while I've been here for a while to kind of have my feet settled, I feel like I know where I'm going now, know what I'm doing now. It's, it's still definitely, I've got a lot to learn. I know that firsthand. Man, it's, it's cool when um, people from other parts of the country move here down South yeah, and they start covering, you know, things like college football or even high school football. They start to realize like, Oh, all those rumors that we heard about, like how people are in the South about their high school and college football. Then they realize, oh, wait, that's true. Yeah. Like, like the biggest thing that I've told people when, when they ask me about, like, what's it like living in Alabama? What's it like living in the South? Uh-huh. And I would always joke, like, like the like the, it just means more thing in the SEC. Like it's a meme, whatever. And now that I've lived here, I kind of get it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, 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 I get where that comes from now. <laughs> Yeah, man, it, it's it's cool because like living growing up here all my life, pretty much in the South, it's always been like a part of just the fabric of who we are. And it, it's like, you know, weekends in the fall or football. And it's like from August to January, February, it's nonstop football. And even from February to the following August, it's still nonstop football. <laughs> you know, it's what is your team doing in recruiting, practicing, two a days, training camp, uh, uh, spring games. You know, there's always something. You know, so it, it's it's a constant thing, and it, it's almost like uh, I'm a huge pro wrestling fan, and I tell people like, if you ever want to know how football is in the South, it's like pro wrestling. There is no off season. You just day after day after day. There's always something to look. At. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. Yeah. It's so the- let <laughs> let's start looking. <laughs> let's start looking into this game, man. Auburn versus LSU, another tiger on tiger violence matchup, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, I got a good buddy of mine. He's an Auburn alum, and it, it, we may not text or call each other very much throughout the year, but this week, this is the week where we will talk and text to each <laughs> other the absolute most. And I mean, it, it's so funny because I was like, when he told me he was going to Auburn, we used to work together back in the day. He he, he came home on summer break and was working with us and everything. And uh, he was like, yeah, I go to Auburn and everything. And I was like, oh, I grew up in Louisiana. You know, I kind of like LSU. And uh, he was like, man, they suck and this and that. So I was like, okay, I'm going to lean into it now. I'm going to really <laughs> like make you think I'm like this hardcore like LSU fan when really like, that wasn't my team growing up. I like Florida State and Miami, you know, and, and it was just it was funny because he would he would always needle me in and I would needle him. But this is a rivalry that I thought had a lot more history to it. And when I look back, there's only been 57 games played yeah. in this rivalry. LSU leads the series. Yeah, I I thought that there would be at least 70, maybe 80. There's only 57 games being played in this rivalry. LSU leads the series 32 to 24, and there's one tie in there. Uh, So this rivalry didn't have as deep or as rich of a history as I thought. But, I mean, still, it's almost 60 games, you know, so that's that's still a lot. Uh, Just going off of recent history, uh, LSU has a current one-game win streak because they won last year and lost the year before. Um, 
how do you see this rivalry playing out over the last years? And I know, like you said, you've only been doing this for a few months, but how do you see this as far as a rivalry game coming in, being there, living there, and being immersed in that culture? Yeah, so I, I think obviously, you know, and this is not, I don't think, a disrespect to LSU, but I, I think, you know, when you ask Auburn fans what the rivalries are, the first thing you're always going to hear is Alabama and Georgia. And, mm-hmm. and, and that makes sense by exactly what you just said. They've played a lot more games against Alabama and, and Georgia. Um, so there's been a, there just is more history there. Over the last, you know, decade, two decades, this has been a game that's been played quite frequently, obviously. And, you know, you've seen a lot of weirdness in these games. Like, yes. Even the past two years especially have been just odd, odd football games. Um, obviously, I think LSU has had – you know, pretty easily the more success of these two two programs over the last <laughs> decade. Um, but it's been a game, and like, they're always interesting games. No matter what, like, the team's records are, these two teams play weird football games. And I think that's kind of where some of the rivalry comes from. Like, I know a lot of Auburn players, we met with them today, and we asked them, like, what do you think about going to LSU this week? And a lot of them are excited for it. And not excited of, like, oh, like, we're going to go in there and beat them excited. More excited of, like, it's a really great environment and we're going to get to experience it. And I think that's kind of, I think it's, it's not at least in, in, in my impression and, and you know, you've been in this, in the South a lot longer than me, but at least in my impression, it's not a rivalry that's like, you know, this deep seated hatred of each other, at least compared to like maybe Auburn and Alabama, for example, but it is, it's, it's, it's always an interesting game. It's always a contested game. And when you have that many close games over the years or weird games over the years, there's going to be a bit of history that builds up. And in this conference, there's so many rivalries just because of, thankfully, it still has some geographic ties in this conference opposed yes. to some other leagues. Um, so I, I, I think that's, at least in my impression, where that rivalry comes from, where the history of it is, a little, at least in, in recent years. Um, and I kind of expect the same thing this weekend, of another weird one. Because um, Auburn, Auburn loves, loves weird football games. No one in this league is better at it than Auburn. And I don't expect that to change this weekend in Death Valley. Yeah, it's it's always something like uh, it's it's always I want to say the Auburn LSU game was one of the games where there was like a fire or something on campus in the background. Uh, I vaguely remember this. This was like in the late 90s or so. And there was a fire on campus at one of the buildings and like ESPN, like they couldn't ignore it. Like at <laughs> first they didn't really know what was going on. You just saw smoke. And then next thing you know, you saw the flames and everything when the <laughs> camera like zoomed out. And like, uh, I want to say this was way before they had the add ons and everything at Tiger Stadium. And you can like zoom out into the, the far end of the, the stadium and look out through the campus. And you could see like the flames coming from the building. I want to say it was in LSU. So that was one of my earliest, like craziest memories of this rivalry. Like you said, speaking to like how weird things just happen in this rivalry. Uh, But looking at these two teams right now, uh, they're kind of in opposite directions where uh, Coach Kelly has LSU, you know, on the ascent, it seems. And he's. He's starting to hit his stride now with not just uh, uh, the way this team is playing this year, although this defense is terrible. We'll get to that later. But just the way this program is going under his tutelage, it it, it was teeter-tottering, and that's why they had to make a change. And it seems like Coach Kelly is starting to get this team on the ascent. Whereas Coach Freeze, it looked like he had this team going in one direction, and now it's starting to kind of peter off and go in a whole different direction. So – it's really interesting to see the way these two teams are kind of crisscrossing almost. Is is Hugh Freeze on the hot seat this year? And I yeah. know that that may be like an yeah. obvious question to some people, and it may not be as obvious to others, but how do people feel about Coach Freeze going into this year? He's going to have one of the longest honeymoons of an SEC head coach for a while. And I, and I say that because now, before actually anything on Hugh Freeze going forward, Obviously, whenever you talk about Hugh Freeze, you have to address the past, at least in my opinion. Yes. He, he has a checkered history. He has some skeletons in the closet. I, I certainly can't say I've done, like, all the records requests. I don't know every single record document, all of that. So mm-hmm. I don't want to speak like I was in the courtroom or – I mean, he wasn't in court, but 
you know what I mean. The um, but even with the past and with a hire that was pretty controversial because of his past, he's going to have a long honeymoon because he just built a roster that wasn't ready to win now, and and that's not really his fault. Uh, like I think, at least in my opinion, this is exactly where I thought Auburn was going to be right now, and I think a lot of people like you know you start three and zero, but they kind of started three and zero against a lot of nobodies, and then you play some you know not nobodies in Texas A and M and Georgia back to back, then followed by LSU and then Ole Miss the week afterwards. So then like that's a really tough four game stretch right there for a coach who's putting a roster together of half guys basically that were from the Brian Harson tenure, which mm-hmm. really just depleted compared to the rest of the SEC, depleted the recruiting talent, the recruiting base that Auburn had. And Friesen's had to build that back up again, and that's not going to be a one-year or even a two-year process. I, I think most like like Hugh Freeze has been very blunt himself of like and of saying that he knows this team isn't good enough without explicitly saying that. But he's <laughs> he's in this he he's in this spot where he's not going to wave the white flag to the players that he already has because you obviously don't want to ruin their morale. But he's also very willing to say that on paper, this roster is not as good as a lot of the teams in the SEC. He said that on Monday. Um, and I think that's, you know, truthful. I appreciate that he's at least being honest about it. Uh, he, he has a lot of work to do in, the, in a recruiting standpoint, a lot of work to do from a transfer portal standpoint. And I don't think, like, I mean, again, this is something he said himself, that he's looking at year three or four as when he's going to really start competing. So this is not a quick rebuild. This is not like a retooling process, like kind mm-hmm. of what Brian Kelly had a little bit, because in, in, in his first year, they were already pretty good because you, you had talent on that roster. Hugh Freeze doesn't have that. And I'm not saying they're not talented. Like obviously the SEC football players are better than a lot of other football players in the country, but it's just not as good as other SEC teams. And I think that's okay. And if fans just have to accept that, um, but I don't think Auburn is rushing this at all. And, and, and I, I get that they're not rushing it because Freeze has very publicly been saying be patient. And if he's willing to do that and not get, you know, I don't, I don't, I haven't heard any rumblings or any, this, like anyone upset within Auburn's athletic office. So I think they're willing to let him be patient, give him the resources that he needs and just give him some time to figure this out. Yeah. That's, I, that's what I love to hear, man, because, I've told people this, like, even in this day of age of the transfer portal and everything else, it takes a coach when he comes into a program brand new, especially if there was a talent deficiency or just the schematics don't match with the roster. It takes him two, sometimes three full recruiting cycles. I don't mean just, okay, I got hired in January and that's a recruiting cycle. No, I mean a full recruiting cycle. Which he has at least two. Yeah. At least two for him to shape this program into the way they want it to look, because you can do a combination of recruiting, but you also have to get some guys in there from the transfer portal that could possibly they have the experience of being student athletes, but they more or less fit your scheme and what you want to do and character and leadership, so on and so forth. So uh, you may lean heavily on it early on. In your tenure, and then you may peter off and do more recruiting to bring in guys that you want to bring in from the ground up. So I I love the idea that they're going to give him time to actually work there, not just for turning over that roster and building back up the talent, but also because, you know, college football fans, especially in the South, (laughs) can get really crazy really quickly. And trust me, I. I saw literally Matt House, LSU's defensive coordinator, was trending on Twitter. Like one of the top 20 topics trending on Twitter, there was over 12,000 or so tweets about Matt House, and a lot of them was fire Matt House or yeah. what is Matt House doing? So I, I know how college football fans can bring out the pick forks and the mob mentality yeah. gets going, but that's good to hear. I think that's but, helpful too. That just sorry to cut you off. I think just that the fan base at this point also has not, they're not riling. Like you, I think the fact that, that they competed with Georgia, something that had to happen yes. in a while, like. That helps. It, it's you hate to say a moral victory, but that kind of was a moral victory. Um, and, and I think the fan base is willing, at least for now, because it's so early, is willing to be patient. Because I think that Hugh Freeze, despite everything, has proven he can win in this conference. Just gotta yes. give him a little bit of time. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad because you 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 can't have these kind of expectations and then look at the roster and then say, okay. 
we want to win nine games this year. Right. It's like, no, you have to look at what he's working with. You yeah. know, it, it's like one of those episodes. That, that, that's what I'm saying. It, it's like you can't expect the coach to have a roster that was not even bowl eligible last year and then yeah. come in and say, OK, you're the new coach. We're paying you all this money. We right. brought you in. We kicked the other guy out, win eight, nine games this year. You right. can't expect that. Like if he comes in and becomes bowl eligible or wins a few more games or they look more competitive in some games, even though they aren't bowl eligible and they lose those games, like the Georgia game, for example. Yeah. Then it's like, OK, this guy is doing his job, but you can't expect an immediate turnaround. And I think that what happens with fan bases, especially with that mob mentality, they look at others. Well, how come this guy did this? How come this guy did that? And it's like you can't expect to have your program and your coach in the exact same position to make an immediate turnaround as another coach in another program, because your coach isn't that coach and your program isn't in the shape of that other program. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, so getting into the game itself and just looking at the things like I kind of spoke to about LSU's defense. Uh, one thing, especially this season, like yeah. this is one of the things that I like to look at going into a game if I have to preview a game or anything else. But on that Auburn offense, who are the two or three playmakers on that offense that LSU needs to watch out for? Uh, I'm going to say outside of the obvious Pat Thorne at quarterback because – Pat is the leading, of course, the leading passer because he's a starting quarterback. But he also, I'm sorry, Peyton Thorne. But he also has 45 carries, which is second on the team in carries as far as rushing is concerned. So outside of Peyton Thorne, who is the guy on that offense that this LSU defense needs to worry about? That's a great question because Auburn coaches are still trying to figure that one out too. The, the, <laughs> I was afraid you were going to say that because <laughs> I'm looking at this and I, I kid you not. I was on the phone with my girlfriend. I was like, gosh, these guys use everybody at running back. Yeah. the, the if, They have two problems. And the way I kind of looked at this game is kind of like it's a stoppable force in Auburn's offense versus a movable object in LSU's defense. And how will that go against <laughs> each other? Peyton Thorne does lead Auburn in rushing. He does lead Auburn in carries. He also leads Auburn in passing. But... He hasn't thrown for 100 yards against a Power 5 opponent yet. Like, Auburn, Auburn's passing off is actually worse than it was last year under Brian Harson. There are reasons for that, but it's, 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 not, it's not been statistically as productive even as it was last year with Brian Harson when you were starting T.J. Finley, actually, was the, mm -hmm. was, was the early starter who was not that great and then has actually gone to Texas State and been awesome. But that's a different conversation. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then Robbie Ashford comes in at the end of last year and they run the ball about a thousand times a game. So it makes sense they weren't throwing the ball then either. Um, and they actually played pretty well. Um, but then they brought in Peyton Thorne as a transfer in the offseason. He was not their first choice, but he's kind of who they ended up with. I think they wanted Grayson McCall is what I keep hearing, but there were a lot of reasons why that didn't work out. Um, but they ended up with 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 Peyton Thorne. He's been fine. Like I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say he's been bad because he's ran the ball decently, mm -hmm. but he also hasn't been good. Um, I don't think he's I, he has solidified himself as the starting quarterback purely because another guy hasn't really pushed him significantly. Um, but I also, I'm just in terms of playmakers going forward, I, I think Robbie Ashford, honestly, is the immediate name that comes to mind just because Auburn likes to use him in the red zone. Um, and I think because Auburn has realized that with their uh, run pass option scheme, which is very Hugh Freeze fingerprints on it, because they can run that pretty effectively with Peyton Thorne and they've already been using a quarterback rotation, I could imagine you see – Robbie Ashford kind of still be part of the game plan. Uh, after they lost to Georgia, uh, Hugh Freeze said that they that he wished they used Robbie Ashford more. I wouldn't be shocked to see him more against LSU because he's just a better athlete than Peyton Thorne. And if Auburn wants to run the ball with its quarterback, he's clearly the better. I think Peyton Thorne's done a pretty good job, but Robbie Ashford's definitely better at it. Um, it that was my thing. I didn't mean to cut yeah. you off, but when I saw, like, I kept, like, like I'm looking at, in, in trying to visualize, okay, who's who's going to be a playmaker there? I kind of figured you may mention uh, Ashford because I saw his average. And when I see you average five yards a carry in college, that's good. Yeah. But the thing was, was his longest run, he didn't have like a 50, 60-yard run to skew yeah. his numbers. His longest run wasn't even 20 yards. 
Right. So that's mostly because, and, and because they've kind of used him in the red zone for the most part. So he hasn't had the opportunity gotcha. to run that far. But that's actually why he's such a such a playmaker because you give him the ball with 10, 20 yards to go, you get him on the edge. He's fast enough to beat guys to the edge. He can, he can, and he's he's scored a lot of kind of those short into the goal into the end zone touchdowns. And and that's where he's a weapon because you don't know if he's going to hand the ball off to someone else, run run it himself. He he gives you some interesting options in the option scheme in terms of a pass catcher uh i'm not sure and i say and i say that, <laughs> and I say that mostly as a joke but also like i don't think auburn knows i think they would like to see the the tight end rivaldo fairweather be a little more of a go-to guy he is a really impressive athlete um really like big guy can make a lot of contested catches as a tight end can run as a tight end he hasn't really been utilized a lot. Auburn hasn't thrown the ball particularly effectively to, to anyone. None yeah. of the wires, and this has been a big talking point this week, is because, yes, there is a lot of it. Like, the quarterback play has been part of it, but a lot of it, too, is kind of on the wide receivers here who have not really been able to make any plays to help their quarterback. I think of Peyton Thorne's nine incompletions against Georgia, six of them hit the hands of receivers. And oh, wow. I, I think they were not all drops. Like some were Georgia's mm-hmm. and like Georgia has great defensive backs. They yes. They do. Um, but there were a few that were definitely some, some drops. So they haven't gotten a lot of help. Um, you make maybe half of those, you know, half of those six that hit receivers hands, you throw for a hundred yards, you might have a better chance to win that game. So, I, I think the biggest thing that Auburn has in terms of finding a playmaker or you know, who the playmaker would, would be is they got to find it. Someone's got to step up because they, they do not have one right now. And see, that's what the other thing I noticed was there's only two guys on the whole team in double digit receptions. Hmm. And I'm like, Jay Fair and Rivaldo Fairweather, yeah. like those guys should be eating big and having a field day against somebody like an LSU. Yeah. And unfortunately, when I saw one of the things that really stuck out when I'm looking at this game, that makes me it, it kind of made me leery. Because when you look at just numbers and just stats and you see that Auburn doesn't even average, they barely average. I think it's like 156 yards passing a game, yeah. but they average like 160 or 200 or so on the ground. Yeah. So. LSU is really built to stop the run, but they've shown that they they have, at times they have trouble stopping the run. Yeah, but their pass defense has been their Achilles' heel. But that's like you said, it's sort of the movable force against the 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 it's immovable object mm-hmm. because like LSU's deep pass defense is terrible, but <laughs> Auburn's pass offense is terrible. So it's like who's going to do what yeah. against who? And I'm looking at this game and I'm just like. I don't want to say it's going to be an LSU blowout, but it has a high probability of that if Auburn cannot get their offense going. Yeah. And that's what that's why I was like, okay, I have to ask this offensive playmaker question yeah. first because yeah. Look, I know what, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's that's one hundred percent what it comes down to is if if Auburn cannot pass the ball against this LSU secondary, which when I was doing my own like research and prep for this game, and you look up Auburn's def- I mean LSU defense, and you see that for the secondary, I was. Like, that's not what you think of when you think of LSU. And I, I, I think there's something like 121st out of 130 teams in total defense. That's mm-hmm. not LSU. And, that's, and you know, I think if I had to choose who's going to win out, I'd probably lean LSU just because, again, on paper, those guys are really talented. And at some point, they're going to figure it out, you'd think. Um, but and, – and if Auburn if Auburn cannot pass the ball against that secondary, they're gonna, it's going to be a blow. I agree. If Auburn can pass the ball against that secondary and find finally find some success passing the ball, this has all the makings of another weird Auburn LSU game. Yeah, and I'm looking – one of the things that I'm really looking at is, you know, when, when LSU is on offense and they're trying to, you know, run their offense, and Jay Daniels has been great this year, um he's been unbelievable and he's almost had to be perfect because the defense has been so so bad so when i look at lsu on offense and how like crazy this offense has been and literally jane daniels is on target i want to say for like 36 38 40 touchdown passes this year which would be second all time in school history you know well ahead of the who would be the potential third place 
I believe it's Jamarcus Russell with like 28 or Rohan Davey with like 26 or something like that. Yeah. And Joe Burrow is far and away the leader with that. There's 60. So when I'm looking at this offense and Logan Diggs has stepped up as the bell cow back, because one thing about LSU and I know Auburn, you guys are, are Auburn is, is running the ball a lot and they're using everybody to run the ball. But LSU typically has a stable of running backs, but they always have that one bell cow guy. Yeah. Logan Diggs has stepped up to be that bell cow guy. Jane Daniels has carried the ball a ton and he's been tremendous. But who is it when Jane Daniels and Logan Diggs, Malik Neighbors, and those guys line up? Who is it when they look on the other side of that field that those 11 Auburn Tigers and they say, hey, that guy right there, we need to point him out pre snap because we need to know exactly where he is every time we snap the ball? Who is that guy to look for that LSU needs to figure out on Auburn's defense? Yeah. Cut. Couple guys immediately come to mind. That's because while 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 Auburn's offense has been so bad, his defense has been really good. And I don't. I think that's the total opposite of what I thought I'd be sitting here and saying maybe two months ago. <laughs> but that's kind of where it's at. And the the defense. I mean, again, Auburn did not lose to Georgia because of its defense. Auburn lost to Georgia because its best safety, Jalen Simpson, got hurt in the fourth quarter, and Brock Bowers had a million yards. That. You know, Jalen Simpson might not play this week. Uh, we have we we have, we're at practice today, and Simpson was was practicing separately, kind of not in uniform, doing some agility drills, stuff like that. I believe his status is so to speak day to day. Mm -hmm. um, if if he is able to play, he's probably my number one guy in terms of who's that playmaker you got to look for on defense. He leads the nation in interceptions. It, he, he's been just incredible at a safety, which is a position he really. Is kind of learning recently, and he's been really, really good at it. One of the best in the country, actually, so far. He's the immediate guy because he can do. If if you're not you're not going to stop LSU's offense, I like Hugh Freeze called it. I I want to say he said it was one of the best college offenses that he's ever seen. Um, and he's he, he said like he compared it to that to that 2019 Joe Burrow LSU offense. I'm not sure if I'd go that far. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more context and more sample size with that Joe Burrow. And I mean, that was probably the best offense in the history of the sport. So I don't really know right. how to compare that part to it. But it's it's a really good offense. You know, Jaden Daniels already has, I think, like triple the passing yards of Auburn's total team. The like, <laughs> yes. it's incredible. He's been so good. So I guess I guess Jalen Simpson, if he's able to play, is the, my immediate answer for that. Auburn's going to need Marcus Harris, a defensive tackle, to be as good as he's been the past couple of weeks. He was incredible against Georgia. Uh, he'll need to be that again against LSU, just because you're going to need some help up front. Um, Auburn's also pretty is pretty injured on its defensive line. They've lost the starting defensive end this week um, or last week. So that's going to be a spot where you really need him to step up. The freshman Keldrick Falk, who's going to be, be that replacement at defensive end, is Auburn's top rated. Uh, freshman in terms of high school recruiting um mm -hmm. he was a, his upper four-star guy uh he's been excellent i think it's, there was um i forget the exact stat but but something like he he is like one of auburn's highest productive players even in a limited amount of snaps so give him now a lot more opportunity you're hoping he's going to be doing even more than he already has uh auburn secondary is a really you know veteran experienced group beyond simpson um Injured as well, but you have kind of your main two starting quarterbacks. Starting cornerbacks will be good to go. Um, that's probably the, the strength, so to speak, of Auburn's team, and you're going to need that strength to really show up, um, or else LSU is going to throw for ten thousand yards. And you're because Auburn doesn't have much of a pass rush at the moment, and, and and that's kind of an issue here. I mean, it's not non-existent; like it's been there in, in spots, but they need it to be more consistent, and they they just haven't had that. So a lot of this game is going to come down to what Auburn secondary can do, Jalen Simpson specifically, um, and uh, the, 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 the corners, Nehemiah Pritchett, DJ James. But you, you need Simpson to be healthy. I, I, I cannot imagine many scenarios where Auburn has a chance in this game without Jalen Simpson. And I think the fourth quarter against Georgia shows it. Brock Bowers did basically nothing all game. Jalen Simpson hurts his calf late in the third quarter, early in the fourth quarter. Bowers has a hundred and some yards in the fourth quarter, and you lose the game. It's Brock Bowers. Yeah, I guess it, it definitely. <laughs> and and one of the main reasons why I think Jalen Simpson is also important is because when you look at LSU's receivers, and specifically Brian Thomas Jr., you're going against a guy who's 6'4, yeah. 200 pounds. He's an NFL ready, big body wide receiver. 
You know, you have uh, also Mason Taylor, the tight end at 6'6". Yeah. You know, Malik Neighbors isn't the biggest guy, but, I mean, he's the one of the best yeah. wide receivers in the country at six foot, about 190, 200 pounds. Yeah. So when you're looking at these guys, and Kyron Lacey, 6'2", 215, you know, and then you got Chris Hilton, who's about 6'1", 180, but he got track speed. So you're looking at all these guys with all this size and all this speed and agility, you're going to need a guy like a Jalen Simpson who's 6'1", about 175 or so. He may not be the strongest, 180, I'm sorry. He may not be the strongest guy, but, I mean, you're going to need that long, lanky frame going against these bigger body wide receivers. Um, The thing that I love about uh, Keldrick Falk is he was one of the the, – one of the things that I always ask everybody else about is the body guys, the guys that – that you want first off the bus when you're getting off the bus, you know, and at 6'6", 290 pounds, he's one of those guys where I'm like, if I'm getting off the bus, I want that guy to get off the bus first because he's just one of those guys where he walks off of a bus or into a room in an area, wherever it is, and you're like, that guy does something. It's probably football, but whatever he does, he's probably really good at it, and he looks really big and scary. So I love the fact that, you know, he's one of those guys where he's probably going to be slated at maybe like a defensive tackle. But to be honest with you, and if he was to move up to the next level, he could play anywhere along the front, yeah. to be perfectly honest with you. Because at 6'6", 290, I, I haven't seen much of him, but he's pretty athletic for that big of a guy. So he actually came into Auburn as, as, as an outside linebacker. They had him. That bulk, is insane. Like they, they had him bulk up over the summer to get to two ninety, so he could play defensive end. But he, like, so, so he's 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 been learning. I mean, Auburn kind of runs an, an interesting front where they essentially their defensive end is kind of an out is like a big outside linebacker, so yeah, it, it fits him pretty well. Um, but he's a really interesting character too, from the standpoint of uh, one of my colleagues asked uh, one of Auburn's offensive linemen today about Keldrick Falk, just given he's going to have a much expanded role this week. And and th- th- this was a like Gunner Britton, who's one of Auburn's guards, and and he basically said, you know, I was a two star rec- recruit at a high school. I went to Western Kentucky to start with, transferred here. But when you go up against a, a guy like Keldrick Falk in practice, you realize, I see why he was rated that way, and I see mm-hmm. why I wasn't rated that way. <laughs> yeah. so, like, that stands out to people, and and that's you know that's what Gunner Britton himself even said. Yeah, and man, it's it's one of those things like um, I look at LSU's defense and I say, you know, you, you look at these guys and they have the body guys. You know, they have these guys. But I look at Auburn's defense too and I'm like, you know what, the talent or what have you may not be there, but these guys aren't like just run of the mill. This isn't like a D2 or a lower D1 school that you're going against. You're going against guys that have size and strength and speed, yeah. just and like you do. Yeah. You know, so you can't take these teams lightly. And when I was watching some of that Georgia game last week, I'm looking at them and I'm like, this is now, mind you, I don't feel as though Georgia is the number one team in the country. I really don't. I think they may be third or fourth at best. But at the same time, we're still talking about a top five team in the country regardless. Yeah. Auburn hung in there with that team. And I think yeah. just like you said, had Jalen Simpson not gotten hurt, that game may have turned out a lot differently. Yeah, Perhaps we even resulted in an Auburn win. We can't say yes or no, but we just know where that turning point came was with his injury. But looking at these teams, you know, side by side, I just think that this game will start off competitive because LSU is a notorious slow starting team, (laughs) despite what some of the people on our game thread would say, like, and I said, Hey, this team has always started slow. And they're like, what game are you watching? And I'm like, the same one y'all are watching the same (laughs) other few games y'all have watched. Have y'all not seen that this team started 